All right, uh, hello everybody. It's 4.03. We'll get started for the sake of uh, people online who are obviously busier than you. <laughs> so thanks for everybody for coming in person. I know the, the whole front row is empty here, but it's just so nice to see people. I don't think I've been in a room with this many people in at least two years. So thanks for braving the elements and uh, wearing your masks and being here. So I'm gonna go through uh, the year in review and give you what I see as the state of the APT Center. Um, Mark Walker, Dr. Walker will be uh, facilitating questions from the chat and afterwards and uh, we'll just move forward. So I always like to begin these things with a, a reiteration of our mission. I don't have to read this to you, but um, I'll just point out a couple of key phrases, right? We exist to ad advance technology along the trans translational pathway, and we're, all we do is in the service of veterans, all right? If this is new to you, you're obviously not looking around the medical center because it should be posted in every lab that's associated with the APT Center, and uh, if not, we'll give you one and tell me who your PI is and uh, he'll get a good spanking from me. So anyway, um, read this and reflect on it every day. Don't just walk by. It should be at the front of everybody's minds. All right, so what does the center do? Who are we and what do we do? Um, I wanna point out our partners on the lower left here my laser pointer doesn't quite work, so we'll have to play semaphore. Um, not only the university and the Cleveland Clinic partner with the uh, Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center, uh, but also the Cleveland VA Medical Research and Education Foundation and our three major VSOs, the Buckeye Chapter of the PVA, the Disabled American Veterans, and the Cuyahoga County uh, Department of Veterans Services, so I wanna Thank them for their participation. Our research cores are prosthetics and orthotics, neural interfacing, health monitoring and maintenance, and activity-based neurorehabilitation. So almost all the work we do falls under one of these broad umbrellas, or maybe I should call them actively managed portfolios. Um, across the top, you see a number of projects here from the clot chip, which is a point of care technology, to the Euromonitor, which is a, a wireless, catheterless way to monitor bladder pressure, um, several exercise programs, uh, cycling and rowing, um, a representation of our sense, uh, sensory enabled prosthetics program for the upper limb and the lower limb. That's seven and 10. Also an exoskeletal program for non-SCI um, individuals. And uh, a shout out to our uh, co-op program and our efforts for diversity and inclusion. Um, in the center there, uh, I didn't make the slide, so I didn't put it in the center, but that's our self-leveling walker, which uh, was developed here and um, is gaining some commercial interest. So um, that's a device where the front and the rear legs uh, reciprocate to adjust to ramps, inclines, and allow people to go up and down steps um, without having to modify their homes. All right, that's us in a nutshell. If you wanna see any of these things in action, please go to our YouTube channel. Uh, the link is there and you can also click on the QR code. We had a busy year. Um, it's always a struggle to uh, narrow down by month all the great things that happen within the center. Okay, um, this is also gonna be posted around the medical center. Uh, I know the font is too small for anyone to read, but I'll highlight some of the most important ones of these. So thanks for making this a busy year and uh, helping advance our mission. All right, so who are we? 
this is our core cadre of card-carrying VA employees who we consider core investigators. So um, they're funded by the VA or they're employed by the VA, and uh, they're the ones whose efforts show up in our annual reports. But we're more than just the VA. We wouldn't exist without our collaborators at the clinic and at Case and other places. Um, but I want to point out that we added a new investigator. This is uh, Elvira Baron, who is the uh, director of the Simulation Center here, and we're looking forward to working more closely with her as uh, the years go on. And in addition to this, uh, these are our associate investigators. So there are people with um, either 100% appointments at other institutions, but they work closely with uh, VA clinicians and clinician scientists, or they primarily affiliate with uh, another center of excellence but still collaborate with us. Um, so they're just as important as anyone else in facilitating what we do. We did add some new associate investigators. Um, Ch uh, Chase Cow up on the upper left is in mechanical engineering and his specialty is in wearable sensors and smart garments, which I'll say something about in a little bit. And along the bottom, Nathan Mikowski and James Solzer, who are in uh, the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and uh, primarily appointed at uh, Metro Health in the uh, Metro Center for Rehab Research. All right, so what does the center do for all these people? These are the programs we try to keep running to help you all advance our mission. All right, we uh, provide an engineering core and the center helps support project management and guarantees uh, continuity between projects. Um, we provide regulatory support with supporting FDA communications. We also have established a, a fully functional and well-running medical monitoring committee um, which is very valuable. Um, we help with research with our innovation incentive. These are small pilot grants, if you will, that the APT sponsors to help jumpstart uh, the next thing to help us get preliminary data to support a larger merit award or an NIH grant. Um, we have internships. Uh, summer internships, uh, statistical support in terms of operations, uh, grants management, communication, contracting purchasing, information technology. These are people that you all can rely on to help get your work done. Services you can't build into a merit or a NIH grant. We also have developed in the past two or three years uh, a very robust translational component to our services. We help with IP filings. Um, I'll talk about two programs that um, are now up and running to help people with their translational activities, uh, the Innovation, Innovators Network and the Technology Translation Assistance Program. Uh, we do market analyses, run vet veteran engagement panels, and just help people navigate that space about what happens after you write the paper. These are the people that help us uh, maintain our relevance. Uh, senior management up there is the usual suspects. Um, and Leadership Council, we've added Janet Gerber to the Leadership Council. These uh, people in leadership council are the eyes and ears of the people in the field, all right? They help senior management implement new directions that we sent. First of all, identify new directions we need to go, then help us implement directives that come down from central office uh, or implement new programs that we want to initiate. 
behind the scenes, uh, the operations team, um, V makes everything work with his team. Um, Frank Zicko is paid by the medical center and detailed to the APT to help facilitate uh, getting APT developments into the INET program. And I'll have a few words to say about INET. Will Rasper has been around for a couple of years now, and he shares the people in the middle are kind of the bridge between the operations and kind of the hardcore research engineering team. All right, so any investigator in the APT Center can get access to these people and can get their projects on the schedule of the engineering team. We have a method to do that. Uh, there's an on online technical request form, and these guys will juggle priorities and see what they can do to help any of us. We've added, uh, Emily Johnson has recently made a transition. I don't know if it's a transition, but it's an addition to her duties as a regulatory uh, specialist. Um, and she's taking on over some of the communication roles, uh, particularly our social media and uh, email marketing kind of uh, outreach efforts. And Matt Schoen is uh, doing purchasing and just about anything else that V asked him to do. Um, OK, I'll go into some the boring stuff first. Um, this is our core investigator funding. So this is funding from just those VA people that I talked about. Um, and you can see it, it's very balanced, almost equal VA, DOD, and NIH funding. But I want to draw your attention to uh, the piece of the pie that's about 9% from foundations and state sources. Um, this is actually up about three quarters of a million dollars from last year. And it's due mostly to that growth of the not-for-profit industry and states uh, sectors. Um, the DOD and VA were actually down about 10% from last year. But the NIH was up by about 20%. And this industry state not-for-profit was up. It almost doubled over last year. So this is all good. This means you know all our eggs are in one basket, and this was actually a goal of ours during the last grant submission to diversify the portfolio and get us on a sustainable footing. If we look at that over the years, we can see we're just about at our peak at $18 million in FY22. Um, actually, that is our peak. Um, but the main thing I want to point out is that amounts to about a million dollars per core PI, or about a 14 to 1 return on investment from core centers dollars. So the VA is giving us money. We invest it in those programs I talked about, and our investigators uh, are paying us back at about a 14 to 1 ratio. Um, I defy anybody's 401k to make that return on investment these days. Um, but this 1.5 million is up from, from about three quarters of a million per PI last year. So our programs are helping people. I, I choose to believe our programs are helping PIs to be more productive. All right, if we look at just VA funding, a uh, number of new grants, so I'm not going to read them all for you here. Um, you know, largest ones from uh, Jeff Capadona and Allison Hess and Janet Kaburr and Steve Majerus. Congratulations. But that amounts to about almost $4 million in new VA support. Um, the non-VA support, though, um, is a long list also. I want to point out the heavy hitters at the bottom of the page. This is a uh, alphabetical, not in terms of uh, largest uh, breadwinner. Um, thank you, Andrew Schofstall and Dustin Tyler for bringing in 15 million 
2 million. Um, that all, everybody amounts to about $22 million in non-VA funds. One of the other things we're graded on is our translational output, and one of the ways we measure that is in intellectual properties. These are patents issued last year, which is a lagging indicator. You know, you have to do the work, file the invention disclosure, someone has to decide it's patentable, then you wait for the patent office to act on it. But six patents issued is a pretty good, it's a pretty good deal. The VA is getting pretty, these are all either completely owned by the VA or jointly owned by the VA, shared by the VA, and case or the clinic. So the VA has a share in all these. And I should say, in addition to these patents, we have two new licenses. So the main take home here is disclose, disclose, disclose. Um, Frank Zitko from INET is helping, and uh, Dr. Jonathan Baskin will help you decide whether, if you're on the fence about whether what you've done is patentable um, or disclosable, and uh, actually help you through the paperwork that the VA has to, to file a disclosure. Um, you have to file the disclosure before the intellectual property gets protected, so uh, you don't want to get scooped. All right, these are the, the technologies transferred. Um, a shout out to Margo and Steve again. Steve's in the center because he has a hand in both of these things. So I guess the point of this slide is if you, want to if you want to translate your technologies, get Steve on your team. Um, the Euromonitor uh, was licensed to a small veteran-owned small business um, called Bright Euro, and human testing of the Euromonitor is underway, and for those of you who don't know, that's that wireless bladder pressure and volume sensor that transmits bladder condition wireless, wirelessly out to either a, a clinician to read or a wearable halter monitor without a catheter. That's the innovation. Um, traditional neurodynamics, you go, you have a catheter inserted, you wait around, you get your neurodynamics done, and uh, no one knows how that changes during the course of the day. Uh, this is a huge step in making that diagnostic uh, function available 24-7 um, remotely, possibly, so someone, uh, a clinician in their office can monitor that, or it can be written to an external recorder and then downloaded for analysis. But the, another innovation is that that sensing capability allows uh, neuromodulation to occur, right? Either uh, sacral stimulation or pedental nerve stimulation or some other method to actually detect when the bladder is getting full and close the sphincter or, and prevent leakage, um, which is no fun for anybody. Um, on the left is another uh, technology or project that is ongoing now. Steve is working with John Baskin, Jill Pinot, and Dustin Tyler on a, uh, an artificial barrel reflex. So in people with recalcitrant high blood pressure that's not responsive to pharmacological agents or um, lifestyle changes, this the notion is that we can the team can sense pressure on the carotid nerve, find out when the blood pressure is dangerously high, and or the carotid artery, I should say and then stimulate the carotid nerve, which then fools the nervous system into think, thinking that it should do something, right? Uh, the etiology is that the pressure signals from the, the arteries are not getting to the carotid nerve for it to take action. So we're closing that dysfunctional loop uh, with this uh, approach. So the, the nerve cuff electrode, the composite 
flat nerve interface electrode that was developed uh, by Dustin Tyler and other members of our team um, was licensed to company Barologics for this application. And they're actually, this is uh, this work is partially sponsored as a some corporate sponsorship to pursue this work. So congratulations to both those teams. So how are we doing so far? Been a pretty good year so far, right? Okay, but we're just getting started. Oh, Paul got a head start on this. I wanted people to match the investigators on the left with the awards that they won this year on the right. Guess who won a top 10 clinical research achievement award? Anybody? <laughs> that would be Paul Morasco. Who do you think won the Physician's Clinical Excellence Award from the PVA? Our Dr. Hensel. And her partner in a lot of research, Kath Bogey, was named Editor-in-Chief. I don't know if that's an award or a burden, but uh, congratulations in order. Anyway, um, they're looking for reviewers and submissions, so any of you people want to get experience reviewing for a journal or looking for another outlet, another venue for your work, talk to Editor-in-Chief Bogey. Dustin was named as a fellow to the National Academy of Inventors. That's a big deal. But Margot, this has actually just happened in February, Margot and uh, Pedro Maseni were named as senior members to that organization too. Margot also won the Excellence Award for the Society for Women in Urology. So she gets double kudos. Janet also became the treasurer of the Microscopy Society of America, and Steve won the best paper award in the IEEE censors meeting. Finally, the APT Center itself was named Co-op Employer of the Year from Youngstown State. I wanted to finish this slide by congratulating three other PIs on being named uh, the inaugural, inaugural class of innovators at CASES Innovation Week. That's just a local thing. But uh, Aiden Friedrich, uh, a student with our team in the Motion Study Lab at the APT Center, uh, won the two-minute um, two poster presentation award, too. And they all got these medals that are too heavy to wear. So all good. Keep it up. In terms of dissemination, we had 62 peer-reviewed papers in top-tier journals, um, up from about 55 in 2021. And these are mostly with impact factors of about three, which is pretty darn good. Um, we had uh, five articles in the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs and four in scientific reports. But you can see here some of the, the Journal of Neurology, JNER, the, uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. None of these are, none of these are slackers. So the uh, scientific community is getting good taste of the things we do here. We've also made, uh, gotten back out into the community personally to attend conferences and meetings, like the Wound Healing Society, uh, Amputee Coalition, the PVA Summit. Uh, you can read them all here. Um, so out and about, spreading the word. On the lower right, you see that self-leveler again with Stephanie Bailey and Frank Zitko. Uh, Stephanie runs our TTAP program, and Frank is an innovation specialist, as I said, and uh, they brought the self-leveler with them and demonstrated it in front of uh, a whole bunch of potential stakeholders in Washington. But this is really insane. Dustin got the call, I think the day before, to represent his work 
uh, on sensorized prostheses funded by DARPA at the launch of ARPA-H. If you don't know, ARPA-H is the health-related uh, counterpart to DARPA. So instead of a defense advanced projects program, it's a health-related advanced projects program. And he got to meet uh, President Biden. But that's not all. Dustin also attended the uh, Consumer Electronics Show where he presented some of his work that he's pursuing outside of the APT Center on remote sensation. And just take a listen to this. Okay, this is insane. Um, I'm able to move my hand in Los Angeles. Get out of here. That's crazy. He's actually shaking hands with someone across the country. I think it might be somebody in Cleveland, actually. Feeling them squeeze. With no connection, no physical connection except the internet. So I don't think I've ever experienced this level of agency. I know there's a lot of surgery, but I've never touched things because of this. I never thought something would let me touch someone 3,000 miles away. Pretty cool. We were also featured in the media a number of times, uh, National Geographic and print and podcasts in Nature in uh, VA Research Week video. Uh, shout out to Michael Fu and, and Mark Walker for that. And I'll just say we expect more of this and stay tuned for coming attractions. That's a little hint. If you're not doing anything Sunday nights at seven o'clock, start watching. All right. Our internal pilot program, our innovation incentives. Um, I mentioned these last year. These are the ones that got awarded last year. I wanted to report out on how that first year of our Investment has gone. Um, I won't talk about all of them, but you know, Andrew Schaustall is looking at developing a resorbable electrode. It's basically a flexible polymer that's conductive that is resorbable. And there's lots of evidence that if you put an electric field around a nerve repair, the axons will grow uh, more efficiently than leaving the biology to its own devices. Uh, but something like an approach that takes advantage of applying an electric field to the nerve specifically, you know, you can apply an electric field from the surface, but you never know where the current's gonna go once it gets to the nerve. To put something near the nerve, then you have to remove it once the nerve is, is healthy again. And who wants to have two or three surgeries, right? to repair the nerve, to install the device, to remove the device. So this could really accelerate uh, nerve repair. Uh, Matt Schieffer is building uh, tiny, tiny electrodes for the uh, vagus nerve in rats. Uh, you need to start somewhere. Um, there aren't any electrodes that allow access to the, the uh, anterior and the posterior um, uh, vagus nerve without a whole lot of traumatic dissection. So this thing, tripolar thing, wraps around the nerve, gets both uh, anterior and posterior nerves, and the main application of this is in that Matt is pursuing for this new neural interface is, uh, is obesity. If we can, uh, if he can show that we can inter intervene and uh, allow people to experience, or rats to experience, satiation, let them feel full, they'll stop eating and lose weight. That's the whole idea. Maybe it'll change their metabolic uh, profile also. All right, so we have to start somewhere, and we have to prime the pump so that we can translate this into larger animals, and that events eventually vets can benefit. Finally, I'll just mention uh, uh, Sandy Nat's project, which um, at 
the fundamental level is not an, uh, really a new concept, adding stimulation to motorized exoskeletons. Uh, we've been doing that for years. Uh, groups around the country have been doing it. But you can buy motorized exoskeletons. They're on the market. They don't have the capability to add uh, stimulation, neural stimulation of the large lower extremity muscles. And so these things generally just uh, carry people around. Uh, people get the health benefits of having stronger upper extremities and trunks and being upright, but you could probably do that in a standing frame or go to the gym. Getting those large lower extremity muscles pumping blood and contracting is really the key to cardiovascular workout uh, in these people. So why not add a surface stimulation system to an existing motorized exoskeleton so that the muscles contract when the motor is driving the motion and the muscle would be experiencing a concentric contraction anyway. So the contractions are not driving the motion, the contractions are working along with the motion to have the muscle contract in an appropriate manner. So a uh, little bit of money to repurpose some of our devices by that crack engineering team, uh, wireless external uh, inertial sensing units to get at joint angle and surface stimulation. And I, sh I should say, uh, this means we don't have to hack in to every device that comes on the market, right? Uh, until recently, there were three devices on the market. Now there are two. There are likely to be more. Um, if we do that, everybody's device is different. Every control system is different. Uh, this is device agnostic. You could buy any, any exoskeleton, add this to it, and off you go. Uh, you also don't invalidate the warranty uh, of the manufacturer. Or you don't have to buy another exoskeleton that already has the hooks in it to deliver electrical stimulation. So ultimately, you could wind up saving the VA money because there, there is an installed base of people with, in the VA with motorized exoskeletons. Finally, this is Mike Miller's project. The problem is that as we insert stimulating electrodes into the spinal nerves at the lumbar level to control the trunk, stiffen the, the trunk in our seated or standing uh, implant recipients. The results are uh, somewhat inconsistent. Uh, surgeons are still taking plain fluoroscopic images, uh, trying to visualize the Scotty dog, which um, probably doesn't mean much to anybody if you're not used to reading x-rays. Um, and put the location just at the sweet spot uh, to get a good strong contraction of the muscles that extend your trunk. Um, we analyzed that, uh, we analyzed, uh, we took CT scans of a number of subjects with these electrodes. You can visualize the electrodes on the right there and we can separate out the good from the bad electrodes and they kind of clump into a go, no go region. Um, but that still doesn't help the surgeon prepare to implant these electrodes. And what we really want to do is increase the consistency of the output and also make the approach trainable. It was, you know, see one, do one, teach one. Um, but if there was a, a standardized protocol and approach, um, that whole process would be accelerated. So in hollow anatomy, which is the 3D anatomical uh, uh, augmentative reality system that's being used at the case school of medicine, um, we can uh, replicate where the insertion of those electrodes have to go. And the real advantage of this over a plain film or a fluoroscope is that you can visualize the nerves as well as the bony anatomy. You can move the model around in space. You can let it align with 
the fluoroscopic images so you can see what you're going to get before you get into the OR. And maybe in the future, we can make it interactive so that a surgeon can actually insert a probe and see where the tip is instead of uh, it being a static slide. Okay, so in addition to the hands-on and the statistical modeling, this is really uh, the next step, a 21st century approach to solving this problem. We've had lots of good interactions with the Innovators Network. Um, the Innovators Network is a, another program in the VA. Uh, their task is to instill and foster a culture of innovation. Let everyone from line staff to clerks in the canteen know what innovation is and uh, work up their ideas to help improve the experience of veterans in the medical center and their families and make, make care uh, more uh, effective. Um, they offer uh, some funding that's broken down into SPARC, which is early stage uh, ideation, uh, SEED, which is uh, a little bit more money, and that's proof of concept, maybe the first prototype in the lab that grows out of a spark. And finally, a spread, which is taking that idea and distributing it to other VAs. I'm going to talk about the two spreads that happened last year. Uh, one was led by Lisa Lombardo uh, that took our rowing exercise program and transferred it or implemented it at the Minneapolis VA. And Mark Walker's... Uh, pilot study on vestibular, portable vestibular eye tracking, which went to the Pittsburgh VA. So during the course of last year, the team improved the seating support and positioning, made a tablet-based interface, wireless interface, with an instrumented rowing machine that you see being used there on the upper right, and a digital coach, so uh, working with the engineering team, and Rachel Mann in particular, um, so that it was easier for clinicians to tune individual users on this rower up. Um, so that made its way there, and we're going to be looking to uh, continue this program, maybe expand it to other VAs, and I should say these are implementation projects, not research, and what we really want to do is see, maybe this will be the start of a merit review that will look at the uh, efficacy of rowing exercise on physiologic member, measures of health in disabled veterans. All right, it's the first step. Uh, Mark and his team uh, built uh, additional prototypes that were hardened enough to, to put in other people's hands. Uh, those are the people that are at the Pittsburgh VA. Um, and uh, this tracks eye movement in ambulatory people. So um, if you have a vestibular disorder and or your eye movement uh, you can't focus, um, it's really important to know what's triggering that, how bad it is, so you can titrate uh, the therapies. And eventually this will let people, uh, right now it's recording to the headset itself. You can see out through the headset while it's recording your eye movement. All pretty cool stuff. Um, it's recording uh, what the person's seeing and how their eyes are moving locally. That then can be downloaded, but maybe eventually this can be done uh, continuously and wirelessly to a clinician. All right, the other translational program I mentioned early on is the Cleveland Technology Transfer Assistance Program, or as they're rebranding themselves, vehicle, which stands for VA Veteran VA Engineering Health Innovations in Cleveland. Um, we stood that up in 2021. It was successfully launched in 2022. Uh, we're one of three tech transfer assistance sites in the whole country. Uh, so this uh, these folks are based. Um, in our seventh floor offices uh, in the 
uh, Richie Mixon building right above Thinkbox, which uh, facilitates the interactions with other startups that are up there, and also have a, a very big uh, and growing presence at the medical center. Okay, their capabilities have expanded. I should say it's renewed for 2023 at about a 50% increase in budget, so they must be doing something right. Um, and this is not just for people in Cleveland, but we should be, you all should be taking advantage of it. I mean, don't get me wrong. They can only, they can only do what people ask them to do. The pipeline's open, right? The project's completed last year. There was one from the Cleveland VA, right? Um, you can see, they come from all over. Reno, Tampa, Chicago, San Francisco. Um, Coming soon this year, uh, they're looking at issues like cable management for surface stimulation for those rowing and biking systems, uh, packaging and form factor optimization for our exoskeleton, and adding wheels to that self-leveling walker, which we understand is a pinch point to com for commercialization. So if you can imagine it, they can build it. Okay, talk to Stephanie if you want their help. All right, did I skip a slide? I did. Um, we maintain a summer internship program of about eight summer interns that, again, has grown in this past year. It's actually doubled in size to 16 undergraduates because Jeff Capadone and Allison Hess got a diversity, equity, and inclusion award from the VA. It's the first year they've offered this award, specifically for undergraduate research experiences. The notion being if you, if you reach out to the, the underrepresented community early, get them experience in VA research, they're probably likely to stay in the VA, either as employees or going to graduate school, maybe work at a VA. Um, so we've been really uh, privileged to have, to build upon the success of our WENCO uh, Summer Scholar Program. 50% um, of the people in that program last year were women. 38% were from underprivileged or un underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, Allison and Jeff are recruiting actively uh, from HBCUs and urban colleges, and they're connecting with veteran student associations to try to scooch up. About 12.5% of those undergrads were vets, too. We asked them what they thought of their summer experiences, and this is what they had to say. You know, I like working on prosthetics. The VA plays a large, uh, they're doing groundbreaking or ground shaking research in that area, and being associated with the VA is valuable for me. I admire what the VA is done. I could see myself working there in the future. Nothing wrong with that. Unprompted and unscripted, I should say. Uh, earlier this year, we also had our first uh, our first student through that undergraduate summer scholarship program get admitted into the doctoral program at Case. Um, and the APT Center is funding first year uh, costs of that for underrepresented minorities. Hopefully, you know, just like the VA funded, expanded that undergraduate program, our goal is to let them take the next step. And that serves two purposes. It increases the representation in the BME department at Case, and it also provides a pathway so we're not losing these students to Ohio State and other places. So, um, and after that first year, we have two training grants that they can move on to that also uh, are reserving spots for underrepresented people. So Molly, I'm not even going to, Molly, if you're tuned in, I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce your last name, but he is going to be a uh, first year graduate student in biomedical engineering and the first ever APT Center uh, graduate fellow. All right. So that's where we've been. 
I promised you a, a peek at the future, all right? Um, our current performance period for the center ends uh, almost two years from now, a little less than two years from now. So we're good through the end of 2024. And like I said, in the last renewal period, we said we would diversify our portfolio and implement programs that would maximize our clinical impact to veterans, our ability to get the word out, disseminate information, uh, allow us to leverage the VA dollars for uh, non-VA and other VA funding, all those things, build capacity, foster collaborations, and enhance translational potential of our work. I think in just last year, I hope I've convinced you we're well on the road to accomplishing all those things if we haven't already. The question is, what happens after 2024? Well, we submitted our renewal in January, a full two years ahead of schedule. Um, and we're looking for, we already have a site visit scheduled, so um, that can only be good news. Site visit scheduled before, was scheduled before the proposal went in, so I'm taking that as a good sign, if you can hear me there uh, in central office. Um, the main point is, don't make any plans for July 13th. Um, you got plenty of time to clean your labs um, and work on bringing uh, our veteran volunteers in for demonstrations. Um, we'll be uh, working with central office to plan that, uh, that event. So what did we put in that center renewal and how does it impact you? I'm sure you're all thinking about that. Well, we identified a unifying theme, or I should say, we looked on everything we've done and we've coalesced around all of it. I mean, all four programs you see there, prosthetics, interface, neural interfacing, health monitoring, and activity-based neuro rehab. They all have things in common. And what they have in common is they're reconnecting things. We're reconnecting organs to their intact sensors or we're sensing physiological processes and connecting that to organ systems or we're connecting bikes to people so that they can work effectively together, wearable robots to users uh, so they can work most efficiently. Um, we're using wireless communications, uh, not just inside the body, but out to smart devices. So if, if we take the center as a whole, we propose to innovate, to integrate, and to translate technologies for connected veteran-centric health. Now, what does that mean? You're gonna help me define that over the next couple of years. But connecting veterans to health goes beyond traditional virtual exams or traditional telehealth, which is essentially a one-way or two-way communication, right? Um, we really want to integrate technology into the lives of the user and their caregiving team. So this requires what Margot told us was not bi-directional communication, but omnidirectional communication. Closing the loops between users, technology, Bio biological systems and physiological processes and clinical specialists, right? So that people don't have to drive 500 miles to a VA to see someone in person. All right, so that means virtually, just to reiterate, virtually all current APT Center projects are either feet first or, or have dove into this head first or are working around the, the edges, all doing important work. Closing the loops between users and their devices, as you can see here, our uh, Army veteran is communicating her, her your monitor is communicating to her smartphone, which is gonna tell her, hey, your bladder's getting full, you might wanna find a restroom somewhere. It's also communicating to her pudendal or her sacral nerve saying, hey, you better close that sphincter. 
But we want to get to the point where it's also communicating to her clinician, wherever they are, and saying, uh, you know, maybe she's not full. Maybe the sensor needs to be recalibrated. Um, maybe their medications need to be adjusted. Um, and then they can notify the user on their cell phone and say, hey, I want, to I want to change your prescription, or give me a call. I think I might want to change your prescription. That's one of the flagship uh, projects I highlighted earlier. Um, the other one was the, the carotid nerve stimulator, which also has this omnidirectional feature, right? Um, it should be able to sense when a person's activity level means their blood pressure needs to go up, right? Um, and then their clinician or the user, when it might not come down as, as quickly as it needs to be. Um, and of course, our sensorized prosthetics work is you know, a prime example of this too, where we're picking up myelectric signals from muscles in the residual limb or elsewhere, using them to control the motor, connecting the user to the device. Uh, the device is sensing closure or pressure. Um, that sensation is getting fed into the nervous system, right? And then maybe we can monitor this from 3,000 miles away. So that's the uh, holy grail. So that's our grand challenge, is to begin to close all these loops simultaneously and efficiently exchange information on all levels to promote independence and uninterrupted function in the home and the community. OK? Instead of coming in every three months to have your meds adjusted, maybe we can skip one of those. And I remember having this conversation with Dr. Walker years ago. If I knew how my uh, Parkinson's patients were doing, they wouldn't have to come in. I could change their meds from their home. Turns out there's a device on the market now that does that. So sorry we didn't disclose that earlier, Mark. Bad on me. All right. We can do this, OK? This sounds like science fiction, but we can do this because we already are, right? I mentioned these three projects. But in addition, you know, Kath Bogu is pursuing a, a electrotherapy for wound healing that monitors the, the milieu of the, the wound bed and changes its stimulation parameters, and also can eventually communicate that to a clinician so that they could also scooch up the current level. Um, I think what gelled this in my mind is the experience we had with COVID. Um, I remember presenting at a workshop, a webinar that I think the uh, Seattle VA, the Climb Center and Glenn Cludy put together in November of 2020. And the senators were supposed to tell each other what we were doing to cope with COVID and help keep our disabled veterans on track in research. And one thing we did was we got approval to send wireless power meters home with our bikers, right? We got approval that those things are commercially available, rights to the cloud, we can reach from the cloud, we can monitor their exercise, increase their resistance, their prescription remotely, right? Um, Turns out those COVID exceptions are now gone. We have to reapply for them. Um, but that, you know, why can't we always do that? Why can't we get these not only out of the lab, but out of the lab with access to us or to clinicians 24 7, right? Um, I already talked about the wireless clinicians interface. And this even works for neural interfaces, right? We have to get information out of the nervous system, either the brain or the peripheral nerve or the muscle. This thing in the middle, center middle, is one of Allison's projects where she's actually wants to do drug delivery and chemical sensing as well as electrical sensing and stimulation at the cortical levels. And that information has to go somewhere, right? It'll go to a controller that will then moderate the delivery of the 
pharmacological agent or something that'll change the delivery of therapeutic stimulation, right? In case I haven't convinced you, uh, what's not bolded are the things we're already doing. What is bolded are some of the, the new things we've added, right? Um, we're getting design inputs from veterans in the focus group, veterans engagement panels that we've initiated over the past year or so. And we're starting to focus effort on user experience and user interactions with these devices. So you don't need a team, a team of 10 engineers to get the thing working um, or diagnose what's going wrong. Um, we have invested in virtual reality and augmentative reality, as I've said. Uh, lower right is Mark and Michael Fu's work, too, in a, a VR therapy that people can do at home instead of coming into the clinic. Um, but we've added expertise in smart garments and wearable sensors, too. What you see on the top right are Chase Chow's work in mechanical engineering case. He's building sensors in the garments, right? He's finding ways to scavenge energy, right, in what's called uh, triple electric nano generators or uh, TANGs, right? So just mechanical energy that's wasted, whether it's your neck expanding or your chest expanding as you breathe, uh, get that energy back into the system. Keep your devices, your wireless devices running, you know, that run on Pico amps keep them running longer without having to be down to recharge them. We've also built new collaborations. I'm listing human fusions here because even though Dustin Tyler, who's been our associate director of engineering quality systems for a long time, um, he's directing the Institute of Human Fusions, which is a standalone institute founded by Case, invested in by Case, and the state of Ohio, as you saw in that earlier slide, doing those science fiction things, like gaming at a distance, or uh, being able to have a haptic feeling of a bomb as you diff diffuse it, or uh, a virtual healthcare provider, right? So HFI is gonna make strides on its own that the APT Center can benefit from and can continue to tap into. But the Institute for Smart, Secure, and Connected System is already working in the space of inter, uh, the Internet of Things. And one of their programs is health connected systems. So they have engineering expertise in this that's available to us. They have courses that are going to be available for APT Center staff engineering staff and project staff to take to come up to speed in this. Um, and we look forward to partnering with them on joint grants submissions and other opportunities that come down the pipe. So I think we have all the major pieces in place and this should position us well to respond to whatever requests for proposals come out of the VA as the Office of Research and Development completes its reorganization. All right, so to try to finish up, um, this cyclist is moving from innovation, which is we define as above, to discover, to explore, and to create, through integration, which is to implement, and to reconnect, and then to assess. And then finally, to translate, which is to disseminate. And again, in the font that's too small to read, I tried to list the existing projects as they slot into each of these pillar, pillars. All right, we're doing this, and we're going to continue to pursue this. All right, so I hope that's clear. I'd like to continue to have the discussion over the next two years about how to implement this. We're leaving nobody behind. Okay, um, except maybe me, because on this timeline, I retire somewhere around here, all right? Don't worry, you'll all be fine. You'll do fine. I won't leave you hanging. 
Uh, the next center director will probably come from that crack leadership team that you already know and that are already performing at a pretty high level. I'm so proud to direct this group of just dedicated, hardworking people um, who want to do the best for disabled veterans. Um, and I look forward to doing it as long as I can.